One beauty here, this is Sansevieria Bantel Sensation, which is the white variegated mother in law's tongue. This is the crested form of the hare's foot fern. Oh. So it, it's Flabodium aureum, which everyone knows the hare's foot fern, and it's a, a cultivar called Davana. It's like a Christmas cactus and it's one called, the name's quite uncreative, Norris Variegated. It's like a big wig. It's like yeah. a great big hairdo. <laughs> that works, doesn't it? <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 82 of Talking Dirty. Over at East Rustenold Vicarage looking princely in plum and many a pattern, we have Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I mean, uh, you, you just said to me before we started this, it's raining with you. It's not here. It stopped. So it's on its way to, over to Cambridge to see Thordis Maria Sophia Friedrichsen glowing in the gloom on this wonderful morning. <laughs> Glowing in the glooming. Uh, hopefully, brightness also heading down to our illustrious guest. We are delighted that for this 82nd episode of the podcast, we are joined by somebody who, who does something quite similar, actually, spreading the gardening joy and the gardening knowledge around the world. Annie Guilfoyle, can we ask if you have a, a middle name to share? I, I do, and you can. It's Elizabeth. It's Elizabeth. Oh. Yes, yes. I think that was after my granny. Yes. I, all so, Irish, all Irish parentage. and, and I, I was going to say, Annie, that you've been named after two of our most illustrious queens, <laughs> Queen Anne and Queen Elizabeth. Uh, well, well, exactly. Whichever one you like. But, but I, I like to link myself to one of our illustrious horticulturists, which is William Guilfoyle, who, who, yes. who did originate well his father originated from somewhere very close in Ireland to where my father came from so I'm I'm claiming him as a great 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 grandfather whether he is or not and then he and then William Guilfoyle went on to um, create the um, Melbourne Botanic Garden so yes so uh, that's what that's who I like to um, you know link with <laughs> well as they say it's in your blood it's in my blood yes exactly. it's a great name Anyone who's watching the video can see your your design space behind you, your studio space, because you are sort of first and foremost a garden designer. Absolutely. But but there's I mean, there's so much, so many hats you wear. And obviously people might know you for your work with Noel Kingsbury doing Garden Masterclass. That's right. That's right. Yes, there are a lot of hats, sometimes rather too many hats. In fact, I was very tempted to wear a hat today. Um, but yeah, no, I do tend to wear probably too many hats. So I, I garden design. Absolutely. I'm down here in West Sussex where I'm based, but um, I also am very committed to education. So teaching is, is, a, is a big part of what I do and always has been. I did a degree in garden design back in the day and um, as soon as I finished the degree I, I started teaching as well as practicing and I think teaching is so important because if you stand up and talk about what you do you have to well you have to know what you're talking about ideally <laughs> it's not always the case um, but also it keeps you on your toes I think it keeps you on your toes so now you're absolutely right um, Noel and I run um, a company called Garden Masterclass which started actually over six years ago probably seven years ago and it was sort of formed because we were asked by Gardens Illustrated to curate their first two festivals that they had and then we sort of looked at each other and thought well we could do this we could kind of roll this out but but in a sort of gen gently more of, sort of not just a long weekend and and also at that point our idea was that if you live in the southeast you know everything happens in the southeast and everyone else in the country gets a really raw deal and they get really knocked because outside the m25 there's you know there's very little happening so we our remit really was to do things out and about and to go up and down the length of the country and into wales and into scotland and into ireland um, and we eventually went into europe um uh, so so um that was the remit uh, doing live educational events and then of course you know that went on swimmingly and every year we increased the number of live events we did um, up until obviously, you know, 2020, um, uh, when, when yes, you know, we all know what happened. And then we had to do this sort of about turn and go online, which like, like you guys do. And, and that's gone tremendously well uh, uh, because for, for lots of reasons. I mean, when, when, you know, two years ago, almost exactly to the day, Noel said to me, well, let's, let's do stuff online. I went, oh, that's a good idea. What, like once a week or something? He said, no, every day. Let's broadcast every day live at four o'clock and I went you're insane <clears throat> but we did it for two and a half months and you know how much if you, you you have to organize beforehand then and you know lining up people 
it was utter madness. But the good thing was that we knew everyone was stuck at home. So, you know, Pete Adolf was stuck at home. Tom Stewart Smith was stuck at home. Everyone was stuck at home. So we there was no excuses of, oh, I'm sorry, I'm in San Francisco. No, you're not. You're stuck at home. So you, you can join <laughs> us. So um, we did this four o'clock every day and we didn't announce who the guest was. People just pitched up and surprise, surprise. Um, we, we, we managed it for, like I say, two and a half months. Then we almost sort of scraped ourselves off the floor and decided to do that once a week. That was enough. <laughs> so now every Thursday evening at six o'clock, we have a Thursday garden chat and we do tell people who's who's coming up along. So uh, and that's a free talk for anyone. And of course, as you know, the wonderful thing about this online world is suddenly the world opens up. So we can have people from South America and from, you know, all over the world, Japan and everywhere, you know, and 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 it's marvellous, not only speaking but also viewing so it was it's just it's been an eye opener and and now we run the two in tandem so live we have managed a few live events last year a handful um where, where it was possible and and this year we have lots of live events lined up so yeah yeah and and in fact we also recorded we filmed a few live events last year so that for people who couldn't or wouldn't or don't want to travel um, that they can feel like they're at at the live event. So, yeah, it's um, it's 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 an interesting and rather hectic life. <laughs> and it is wonderful filming those events and really opening up. Your whole initial aim was to be able to get outside the M25. Well, now you couldn't. Yeah, you couldn't yeah, and wide of course, the scope anymore. Absolutely, and of course, pre Brexit, of course, we went over to Europe and we we've 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 run events in Holland and France um and ireland of course southern ireland but um and and now we still have we have events this year in france and germany and holland lined up um and these poor people have had their tickets for two and a half years bless their hearts you know holding on to their tickets um so so our you know even though it's very difficult now to do anything in europe mainland europe um in terms of you know all of the all of the logistics and stuff um we are determined to to, to go into europe as well so yeah yeah but obviously you listed off some extremely uh, illustrious top names in horticulture. What kind of things happen in one of your masterclasses? Well, it's very varied because, of course, between Noel and I, we've got quite a good address books. I mean, Noel's more the planty end and I'm more the design end. And we meet in the middle and sometimes he'll throw a name at me and I'll go, who? And it, well, that's the most famous person in, you know, Hellebores. Of course it is. Yes. You know. So, you know, our, our, we do we do cross over. So so it can be anything from um, somebody talking about a particular particular genus which is always good if somebody you know a, a talk to focus in on one plant um to uh, you know a more broad uh, broad ranging talk on design or um floristry and floral art you know bridget who you know very well does webinars for us so um yeah i mean it's it's quite a wide range really um our our we're sort of unapologetically not entry level so we we aim at you know professional gardeners designers landscape architects and, and and well knowledgeable keen garden uh, you know amateur gardeners as well you know garden owners but we don't go in at sort of entry level <clears throat> you know we like to sort of you know have you know have this sort of certain level of of uh, of information that we're we're, just, we're we're imparting and also we started about probably about a year ago we started desert island gardens where we choose people to we ask people to choose their five favorite gardens um which they find very difficult as you can imagine um but it's lovely because it becomes like desert island discs it becomes a story generally a story of their stroll through their their world of horticulture and that's lovely that's lovely this is a mean thing to do i feel like we should ask alan for a couple of desert island gardens <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, if I go back in my back into the midst, midst of time, um, I suppose my fifth choice, which would be the final choice, would be Great Dixter in East Sussex because I learned it, uh, that that garden actually opened my eyes, um, and of course the great late dear Beth Chatto because mm -hmm. she's in East Anglia and I'm in East Anglia, and I mean although she's probably eighty miles away from me, I mean that was a garden that was instantly. Um, attractive to me the way she actually I mean she was so innovative I mean go back in her life I mm. mean she was innovative in, innovative in that garden did I get that word right I really don't know <laughs> <laughs> in that garden. it sounded Even right before then when you start to learn about the woman herself the great thing was that she was a floral demonstrator um, and she had a great friendship with um, Cedric Morris at um, Benton End and um, 
She used plants in her floral work, like Aira Metallica and Pictum, for instance. Um, and people still today look at that plant disparagingly as a weed. I don't. I love it in all its various forms. Um, and because I think it's great to have something alive and green in the winter, which it is. And then, of course, you know, Beth, she dug up the car park. She made that dry garden, which she did not water. And I remember people coming to my garden and complaining that it looked dead. <laughs> because the plants were dead on the top, but they were alive underneath. They were waiting. Uh, this was about the summer of 1976. And, no, it might, might have been later than that. But there was a, anyway, it was a very dry summer. Yeah, 76 plant, was a hot summer, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. And her plants estivated. I mean, they, they, they do what Mediterranean plants do. They go underground when, it, when it's really hot and they pop up at the first rains of autumn. Um, and so I think her... Because I know so much about her, uh, she has to be number four. So there's my, fi my fifth and my fourth. And Christa, of course, was a great um, innovator of using plants in different ways. I do remember after he died, Robin Lane Fox, who writes a column in the Financial Times on the Saturday, he did say rather unkindly, I thought. Uh, <laughs> As I did sometimes right. wonder whether Christo was perhaps colorblind. <laughs> <laughs> but you can understand when he put shocking combinations together like magenta and orange hmm. um, and so to some people it would look as if you were probably colorblind but you know to other people but that's a great thing annie isn't it Don't yes, you find that when, you this, when you're gardening and when you're putting plants together hmm. somebody a client for instance might suddenly say well that's all rather safe i want something that's going to jump out a little bit well, um, yes. I mean, sadly, sadly, not enough clients say that. And, and clients, you know, I, I'm sure you're all aware is that you said, poor old yellow takes the hit all the time. Yes. You know, yeah, well, I'm and, just, I have a I have a personal thing that I am. I've got a, a board of this fallow at the moment because it's got greater bindweed in it. And when I get rid of greater bindweed, I think it's going to become a yellow border. Yeah, do somebody it. Somebody needs to champion yellow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I agree completely. And, and I wrote an article for the um, Society of Garden Designers magazine about you know why is poor old yellow given such yes. a such a bad and I, I ended up with this um professor of colour at Leeds University because I assumed this was a cultural thing you know that the fact that you know people go for safe muted pastels and you know I'm sure I, I thought it was steeped in our personal culture not at all it's not at all and um people's dislike and distrust of yellow is a very visceral thing apparently and it's and it's what yellow you know it's what yellow represents and without going into gory detail you know it's things that are yellow that are unpleasant um so so it's 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 much more it's much more ingrained within us and it, and it is very sad i think yes go for it do a yellow border absolutely yeah. well you might notice that the wall, wallpaper behind me is a sort of soft shade of yellow yeah yeah <laughs> And at this so time of it. year, at this time of year, yellow, yeah. you know, proliferates, doesn't it? And, Absolutely. Um, and you'll say to clients, so you don't like um, primroses? Oh, yes, of course I love primroses. Every love primroses. Oh, yeah, but they are <laughs> yellow, you know, and um, and narcissus. Well, yeah, yeah, well, that's different. No, 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 they're still yellow, you know. Oh, it's 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 tough. So when I, in fact, I'm designing a garden at the moment for a dementia care home where colour is extremely important, a bright, vibrant colour. And it's, yes, so I'm really good. I'm going Christo. Of mode you know absolutely wonderful it's going to be <laughs> shockingly colorful and uh so so that's just a joy to have a job like that where you can just go bonkers with color mm. but don't you find sometimes annie that color if you're using color um how can i put this well i remember sort of in the 1970s christo was writing in one of his books he said um, well, perhaps if you really want to be safe with colour, you should paint the wall white and put a white climbing rose against it. Oh, and don't forget to take all the leaves off as well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the safe, and it was everything was white, very pale pink, very pale lemon. Um, but when yeah. you're a garden designer, you must be kind of ahead of that curve, and you're jumping onto the next thing. And you, I mean, you know, fashion. If everything is black next year, it's going to be white and so on and so forth. So it's yeah. going to be soft colours and then big colours. Well, I, I, I'm always asked about trends and I, and, I, and I always kind of hate that kind of what's going to be a trend. But personally, I get very led by art. I think art, architecture and, and design and gardens are very interlinked. And art is a great um, source of inspiration for me. And in fact, this ties quite nicely into the yellow thing, too, because um, about four years ago, Arvensis perennials down in um, Bradford-on-Avon um, 
asked, um, put out a, a call saying, uh, garden designers, landscape architects, gardeners, we've got um, a few spare trial beds that we'd like you to plant up with your chosen plants from our nursery. So they had to be on our Vences list. Um, you can do whatever you like. And, and so we, you know, lots of people submitted a plan. I was one of them, it got accepted. And my, my design was based on a Paul Clay painting called Harbinger of Autumn, which I have got on my wall, but it's kind of around the corner. Not the, not the original, I hasten to add. <laughs> I wouldn't be sat here if it was. Um, Harbinger of Autumn is beautiful, linear. I mean, Paul Clay's paintings are very colorful and, and, and often very linear and blocky. Um, but you know, you could take a Paul Clay painting and, and design a, a planting plan. So I did that. So lots of blues, lots of grays, lots of muted purples, but with a blob of orange. So if you, if you look for the painting and I'll, I'll send you a picture of the painting, um, there is this, I guess it's a tree, a blob of orange. So I could indulge myself with designing a, a, a bed purely based, which I suppose I could have got away with for a client because I could have just not told them that story and said, but the other thing I did is I, I, I deliberately planted in lines like Put, uh, like his painting to see what happens so when you see photographs of, of me setting out the bed they literally are in lines and blocks I thought I want to see what happens will it look weird it didn't look weird at all because actually although the bed was linear as opposed to more rectangular which the painting is um you know plants merge into each other and support yeah. each other and it didn't look weird at all so it was a great experiment but coming back to yellow the designer next to me had a bed of just yellow, which is wonderful. So everything yellow, um, to, to literally to champion yellow, because it is, you know, garden designers, we all suffer this, you know, this apartheid really of yellow, you know, so. That's not, that's not a new thing either. No, no, no. I, no, I remember Christo, Christo writing about it. Mm, mm. Um, and he, he was always one for championing yellow as well. Yep, um, yeah, absolutely. So, Here's so, to so, yellow. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. And I know Rosie Hardy's a great yellow, yellow. Um, you know, she and I often have a little chat on, on, on via Instagram is, you know, let's big up yellow. But no, absolutely. Colour colour is important. And where you get your inspiration from, personally, I do like to use art because if you look at somebody's like Paul Clay's use of colour, oh, you know, you can't yeah. better that, you know just amazing just amazing well clearly you're championing yellow with your show and tell because yeah. you're surrounded by wonderful seasonal plants and there's a big old bold splash of yellow over your shoulder yes yes there is some, and, and don't ask me what they were that's marks and spencers giving away i said giving not selling um or uh, bucket loads of dafts last weekend after mother's day that weren't bought so the house is full now you never it's very rare you get something for nothing especially with marks and spencers so yes <laughs> but don't ask me what they are but they're rather lovely there is um, a double yellow narcissus very similar to that called golden ducat i think oh right right well they, they are beautiful absolutely beautiful and uh, mm. yeah and, and smell divine actually that wonderful yeah. fresh spring smell what we know is they're not just any narcissus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're free narcissus. <laughs> um, it's interesting, though, it's scented daffodils in the house. When we had all the high winds, like everybody else, several of mine went over and I thought, right, I'm going to quickly scoop them up and bring them inside and realised how many I buy that are scented. I think because I quite often place them by doors. Mm, mm. Oh, it's been such a treat having them by the sink. And every time I go to wash something up, just this, yeah. I think it actually might be silver chimes I've got by the lovely. sink. The scent from that, wonderful. It is great, beautiful. isn't it? It's lovely. It's that fresh spring. It's just beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Can't beat it. <laughs> no. <laughs> So your, your show and tell starts with a freebie from Marks and Spencers, not yes. what you were expecting. <laughs> exactly. There are other supermarkets available. Um, yeah, my show and tell, well, I, I sort of, I'm, I was trying to arrange them into some sort of order, actually, but but so I will pick it, pick it around. But I have a bit of a beef and, and uh, with garden designers being lazy about their choice of shrubs and not using shrubs, not using shrubs enough, not using interesting shrubs enough, um, and just being a bit lazy. Now, that's probably a bit unfair and I'm going to get lots of hate mail, but um, it, it is a lot to do with, I think, designers designing from a nurse, a trade nursery list, which might be reasonably limited, but they're not thinking outside the box and not going off to find more interesting and exciting shrubs. We're also riding on the back of a wave of, you know, the perennials and, and, and grasses movement, which wonderful. And we all sort of go weak at the knees with Pete Adolf's dreamy schemes. 
but you know we do need and we need to champion shrubs a little bit more so i've tried to bring in and i wanted to sort of make that point because you know i think it's not that difficult to find interesting shrubs and to and then you know you've suddenly got interest every month of the year and especially at this time of year when you know flowering shrubs and flowering trees at this time of year you know there's you can you're looking up and you're just, you know it's just breathtaking there's one thing that i am trying to do in the garden here and i think it's so important to have fl flowering trees and shrubs that flower later in the year mm. so you get that wonderful season from the middle of july onwards if you like and there are yeah. not that many but they no, are. are there and they're worth seeking out and i mean to do that I would, that's I'd... A, sorry that's a good one to start with then this is Korea. Korea. Correct. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Now that is a Christo combination. That is. That's. Um, <laughs> it is Marion's Marvel, which is which is orange. Well, it's sort of sort of ready, ready, sort of dirty red color and dirty yellow color. And um, I first saw this at Tresco, and they use it for hedging at Tresco. And obviously, you know that um, it did make me think, ah, oh, Tresco. This is you know, and it, I think it's also known as the Australian fuchsia, isn't it? Yeah. Um, now again, you know, it this flowers from you know. November through yep. to possibly even the next November. I mean, it's it flowers right through the winter and it's evergreen. I mean, okay, you might not want orange or sort of you know red and red and yellow or dirty dirty pink and dirty yellow, but there's there's a greeny white version. Um, yes, it might. I don't know. Is it? Have you got it up with you? Do you? Yes. Grow, yeah, you yeah. I, I, I grow it. I grow it against the wall. It, you're right. It's been flowering since November. Fantastic. Um, yeah. And no, actually earlier than that, because the garden was still open, we closed at the end of October. So it was October yeah. and people were wanting to buy it because I didn't have any. Um, but yeah, I've got um, three forms of it. Think I think I've got back Halciana, which I think is the lemony coloured one. Yeah. Yeah. And there's uh, but there's also another little lemony one, which I photographed for Thunder the other day, which I can't remember the name. Lemon of. Twist, maybe? Lemon Twist. Yes. Well, yeah. well done. Oh, well that's, done. That's a dwarf one, which I, I was going to grow in a alpine tub alpine sink but i've actually planted it in a raised bed instead and it's it's done really well absolutely and 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 it doesn't you know it's not that difficult to, i mean this i found it i think i bought at burn coos and i do burn coos catalog is always at my hand you know so that i can because if you want something a little bit out of the ordinary um either burn coos or um bluebell possibly but burn coos are good with lots of you know the little little stuff Bluebell's quite good with the bigger stuff but you know it's amazing if you and I've got it by the front door so that you know it, I see it every day and and that through the winter even if you're not I mean I have to say I don't know how wild I am about the colour combination but it is just uplifting um I think and, the thing about that colour combination Annie is that there's nothing to clash with it absolutely you know yeah. I mean it's it's a it's a dull time of year flower wise from October through until March um so um I think yeah. Anything is worth having that flowers, to be quite honest. Exactly, exactly. And, I and think I think I might be colorblind because I'm crazy about that color combination. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I, I don't mind. I mean, it's growing on me. I think I bought it because I was just so excited about it, and then I discovered the more tasteful versions. You know, the lemony pink and the white and the off white and the green. And I thought, mm, perhaps I would have. But no, I thought, no, no, no. Come on, you've got this one. Just you know, be be faithful. <laughs> no, it's it's lovely. But but you know, it's it's. I think case in point, really. This is uh, you know one of these what we are shrubs like this which sh could and should be used more really and, mm. and and offering so much and then in the same vein really i have a little bit of an unhealthy obsession with olerias um <laughs> this is elisifolia um again burn coos are my are my go-to nursery for olerias um elisifolia for you know holly like leaves and i love olerias um well, also, they're so brilliant in coastal and um, windy situations. They're exactly fantastic. why we grow them here. Yeah, wonderful. H have you got Xenorensis there? Have you got Illyria Xenorensis? I don't think I have. No, well, I, I have tried twice to grow Xenorensis, and it's a much more exaggerated form of leaf like this it looks like one of those those sharks that's got a sort of or is it a shark that's got this sort of you know it looks like a saw and on front of it so xenorensis is um named after Zener in cornwall and i was warned off it twice and of course you know that's like red rag to a ball if someone says well i don't bother with that you can't grow that yeah. i'm bloody well going to 
and I, I have lost two, but and I'm still trying to find because I think Burncoos have given up propagating it because I think it is a bit of a, a bit of a sulky old thing. Um, I think it's possibly available available in Ireland, but it's a beautiful leaf. So Olerias are are you know just I do love them because also the variety of leaf forms that you get. You know there are some that look like a rosemary, and that, that you know there's a macrodonta which is you know very much more like a holly leaf, and oh, then yeah. you know this is just lovely. And so I've got them out again at the front where it's warm and sunny south facing and a tiny little front garden but um yeah very very useful and i did have a very difficult project once in bournemouth on the coast uh, in a penthouse balcony huge terrace really rather than a balcony and i had to look at new zealand plants to for that because nothing everything else defoliated just went into complete shock so i just really stuck to my new zealanders and they really you know they're great with the wind <laughs> mm. <laughs> So, so, so that's good. And then sticking with the um, the shrubby, this is um, Artemisia arboritanum at Lad's Love, which um, is highly, highly pungent. I mean, I'm sure you know it. It's it's yeah. it's either I think it's a, a marmite. You either love it or you don't. Now this takes me back to childhood um, because our garden was full of it. I grew up on Exmoor in Somerset, and um, oh, you know that to me that just transports me back. That and this <laughs> act, it's wonderful. Okay. Takes me back to Great Dixter, actually, because does it? Does it? There. And yeah, I remember, yeah. I remember we were talking about it, and yeah. um, I, I had it, lost it, and it wasn't until I was at a nursery a few years ago, a couple of years ago, fairly recently, and I brushed past it, and the um, scent, and it, I just suddenly was there. Yeah, and I yeah. thought I must take, must get that plant. I mean, it's not showy. It's not. No, no, it's, it's just not. a feathery green thing. It's, it's feathery and green, but you know, all you have to do is touch it, and and I yeah. mean, I think. I think you have to sniff before you buy because you know you, it really might not be everyone's cup of tea. And I looked, I looked at looked at the history of it yesterday, and actually I got through to the Birmingham Botanic Garden, Birmingham in in America, and um and and the the, the folklore attached to it and what it was used for medicinally some quite unpleasant things I have to say um but but a lot of medicinal um uses and properties to this. So um that really is a sort of harking back to childhood. That's just um. And this is actually from my this is from my mother's garden, so very precious to me because she's no longer around. So you know there are plants like that really are so um, you know so much part of of, of childhood and, and where you've grown up from. Um, now um, the other the other one I love, which is Itea elisifolia, which you know has these you know those were the flowers um this is it looks more, like a green the green waterfall in august doesn't it, it oh it's just it's just magnificent now uh, it used to be quite hard to get hold of um i think architectural plants were one of the only nurseries that that did it um and um it is again i show it to people when i'm lecturing or teaching and they you know they, they just don't they've never seen it never smelt it and again from perfume you know you have got this green waterfall and you know these these were the racemes here, which is, you know, it's about a foot long, greeny white and, and scented of honey. And then, of course, buzzing with bees, absolutely mm. buzzing, buzzing with bees. Um, but it's such a brilliant, brilliant shrub. And I actually grow mine on a north facing wall um, and, and it still it does OK. You know, it still does OK. And um, I, I spoke to somebody once who said, oh, you it only flowers every other year. I said, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it flowers every year. What? And this is on a north facing wall. So. That for me is would be a you know desert island plant you know don't don't leave home without it sort of thing. <laughs> <clears throat> it's it's fantastic, absolutely fantastic, and you know and those wonderful evergreens that are scented, just brilliant. I think that going back to that the, the scented plants at that time of the year yeah. and and further on. And yeah. Again, this came from Dexter for me it was two Escalonias. One was Bifida. Mm -hmm. which is a deciduous one. It blooms later than the other one, which is Escalonia ivy eye. Yeah. But both of them are fl white flowered, but they are covered with butterflies in, th in the season, which is July, August and into September, and probably beyond that with, with bifida. Mm. Um, but, you know, absolutely lovely to have flowers at that time of the year. Uh, and actually, uh, yeah. I, just, I just answered an email last week with a picture of Escalonia ivy eye from my garden in it, and somebody had been trying to find out what it was and they couldn't find out what it was and they wanted me to tell them so they could get it for their garden. And that happens nearly once a month. Fabulous, you know, fabulous. Because yeah. that is such a fabulous plant. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ivy Eye has evergreen, shiny, light reflecting, cheerful foliage as well. 
Beautiful, beautiful, and 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 I mean at Dixter, it's it's right beside the Lutchen steps, um, yeah. in front of the, and so it's it's a huge, it's absolutely magnificent. The other one, again, talking about scent and and um, is is um, by Burnham Burke Woody Eye here, and that is just you know that's by my my kitchen door deliberately um and it really for me i mean a lot of these are sort of harbingers of spring this is a fact this is about you know we're on the way out of winter this is amazing um it's quite it's very heady i mean again it might be too much for some people but i think the genus viburnum um you know a lot of people will just go as far as viburnum tinus and that's it you know but i think delve a bit deeper because there's so many viburnums they're generally pretty easy. Um, and, you know, again, anything that's really flowering its socks off at this time of year with such a heady scent is, is amazing. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people probably are put off with growing those sort of viburnums because they think, they look at the label and if they see the size, the ultimate size, and they think, oh, God, God, no, that's far too big. But, you know, what, <laughs> what gardeners forget is they are the masters. Um, and if you get an early flowering shrub like this, you can clip it over after flowering Absolutely. and you can have your cake and eat it because it will flower for you next year and yeah. it will stay within bounds. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No. So viburnums are, I mean, when again, when I'm teaching, I will give students my sort of top 10 shrubs, my top 10 perennials and viburnums, the genus viburnum is definitely in there because there's, you know, within within that genus, you've got so much to choose from. Exactly. I mean, you know, there's 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 masses. Hi there. Hello. How are Hi. you? Hi, I'm fine. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good. I am loving your shirt. Oh, it's it's sea salt. It's sea salt. Oh, it's lovely. Oh, hello, Mr. Gray. Good hello. morning. Good morning. Sorry if I'm talking a bit quietly at the minute. Peter is just finishing a press conference upstairs. Um, oh, so right. I'm, I'm just... I'm, I'm, you can all be as loud as you like. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> I'm trying to... Apply. Terribly important. In a second. <laughs> Press conference in the, my God, is he a Hollywood star or something? <laughs> Annie, your background's lovely. Well, it's chaotic. I've, I've, I've deliberately, this is my studio and it is, it is, um, I, I know that Thordis is, a, is, a, is another horsey woman, but twice a year I muck it out like you would a stable, you know. I'm not going to show you the propagation bench over there, which is also in my studio. Like that, that is, um, I'm not the world's best propagator, but that's an understatement, actually. <laughs> the top episode 82 excitingly <clears throat> 82 <laughs> 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 